Hello and welcome to episode 233 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik here as always with... Jason Urbinowitz and Ian, good to talk to you back on the computer microphone thingy after spending so much time with you and so many other people in person last weekend. That was the most fulfilling trip I have had in a while. I came away from Dorkfest and Spot LAX, I don't want to say with a new lease on life, but certainly a reinvigoration of my Av Geek spirit. It was just such a fantastic weekend with so many people. I think Brett Schneider counted the the raffle tickets that we handed out, and there were over 450 participants. So including the NYC Aviation Spot LAX events, it, it had to have been over 500 people. And I'm pretty sure I talked to almost each and every one of them. Yeah. What struck me the most is that there were a ton of people, most of the people I spoke to who introduced themselves or I, I talked to, were there for the first time this year, which I thought was really interesting. A lot of people, I said, oh, did you were you here last year or before COVID? And they go, no, this is the first year I'm here. And actually, a lot of them heard about the whole event, Cranky Dorkfest and NYC the whole weekend through us actually last year. And we didn't give them enough heads up to go last year. So they only came this year. So maybe we'll give you a six-month countdown and a three-month countdown to, to book your flights and we'll be more on top of it. But it was really awesome to meet so many people, so many of you listening right now, so many young people too. We have to keep the hobby and the interest going in people younger than Ian and myself because we're old and we need the kids to be interested in aviation. And it seems like that's coming along nicely. Speaking of kids, I thought the most impressive person that we met all weekend is a young man of about 14 years old. And Oh, so it's not me. All right. No, you were impressive in your own right, Jason. Thank you, but go on. But this young man, he's 14 years old, Dorkfest and Spot LAX, for those that are listening, I guess to this is their first episode, real quick recap. Brett Snyder, who runs Cranky Flyer, which is an aviation news blog, but also runs a wonderful travel agency in its own right. He, a few years ago, well, more than a few years ago, no, I guess 15 10 years, years ago now. I believe. Well, it's Spot LAX was the oh, 10th anniversary. Spot LAX is 10 so, years. So yeah. Dorkfest has been going on a little bit longer, more than 10 years. And we'll double check the numbers for next time. But basically started this whole thing by saying, I'm going to be at in and out next to LAX in Los Angeles. Come eat hamburgers and talk about airplanes with me while they fly over our heads. And it has grown to a... 450 person gathering with raffle prizes from, I mean, Flight Radar 24 donated subscriptions, airlines have donated tickets or models, other LAX associated places have donated things like the parking spot donated free parking at LAX, that kind of stuff, and just a big collection of av geeks. And so the 10 years ago, Spot LAX got started with NYC Aviation. And now because it's such a destination. They have them on the same weekend, every weekend. And, and the events are fluid and, and people mingle between the two. And, and there's all sorts of things that you can do kind of with both groups along the way. And this 14-year-old young man who is a listener of the podcast, a subscriber to the app, and bigger av geek than I think I ever could be because he has somehow convinced his teacher to let him leave the classroom when there is a cool aircraft flying over so he can go get a picture. All right. I mean, that's dedication. Not every aircraft, but if something special flies over during class, his teacher is totally fine with him leaving class to go snap a picture. So he's committed. He's a committed av geek. And to show his mother how committed he is, he created a 25 slide PowerPoint presentation to convince her to take him from Phoenix, Arizona to Los Angeles for the weekend so that he could come hang out with us, look at planes, and just be in the general vicinity of his people. And it worked. So I was just blown away by his, first of all, his ingenuity and his commitment, but also his his passion. You can tell that this is one of those people who you know, has found what he loves very early on in life and intends to pursue it 
to the fullest. So I thought he was the most kind of impressive Av geek we met all weekend. But there was no shortage of young people there. I think the youngest person there because they wanted to be rather than because their parents <laughs> put them in a stroller and pushed them over to the event. But I think the youngest two were, were four years old. And they're because they loved airplanes, mostly because their parents love airplanes and they've successfully managed to get their kids into airplanes too. But I just thought that was fantastic. And they were so great to talk to because there's no pretense about anything. It's just they were so genuine in their love for the thing that was flying in the sky. Yes. Just you ask, why are you here? And they go, I like planes. And you go, okay. And to be clear, that excuse goes all the way up until probably the the day I die, no matter how old I am when that happens. But to hear that from multiple people that age, four years old is kind of, I didn't like anything that much when I was four years old. I don't know about you, but it's good to see some people pick out such a, a hobby that young and create a 25 slide PowerPoint presentation on, on why you should go to something called Cranky Dork Fest at the in and out next to the airport. And to her credit, his mom was so on board with his, his passion. And she was absolutely committed to making sure that he had as good a time as he possibly could. I was really impressed by her it was clear that she didn't she understood that he was passionate about it but he she didn't really understand why it didn't have that you know little extra step which i know my parents don't they're like you're you, you have fun with that but it was really great to see her see her encouraging that it, dorkfest is such a great event and i mean it, we've been talking about it because I think the biggest thing about Dorkfest, and and I told Brett this over the the weekend, and I told it basically everyone I talked to, is that there's no pretense other than you have to enjoy aviation because there are people there who are, you know, so deep into the industry at the top of major airlines, you know, C-suite executives at major airlines that are there, and then there's a four year old kid, and they're talking to each other. Because they both love airplanes. And it's as simple as that. That is why I encourage anyone to begin planning now. It'll be sometime in the first couple of weeks in September in LA next year. Stay tuned to us and keep a watch on Cranky Flyers website for the official announcement of, of next year's dates. And we hope you can join us then. Excellent. Should we talk a little about how we got there and back? Because I know it's been a little while since you've been on an actual airplane. It has been a while since I've been on an actual airplane. I suppose that's true. If only to talk about your shoes, Jason. We should do oh, that. Okay. We'll get to that. So we've talked about this summer being the summer of suck in New York oh, in particular. Yeah. And you got bit by it, but you could have been bitten worse. I got bit, but we didn't have to amputate, which is important. There you go. There you yeah. go. That's a picture. For all of June in New York, and, and in this case, I braved the elements out in New Jersey at Newark. Travel through the Northeast was just just awful. And again, the same thing repeated in the first couple of weeks of September, where we had lines of thunderstorms to the West that just blocked every route. And of course, this book, I I tripped United. I booked United out of Newark, which is always a questionable idea when there's potential weather. But I was originally booked, really happy about this actually, an internationally configured 777, which 200, which would have been really nice. Had a nice economy plus seat all picked out. On my way to the airport, I got there a little early. I, I looked at the radar and saw, oh, geez, there's a lot of storms building. So I got there early and I opted to move up an hour because you know it's New York to LA, there's, there's flight literally every hour or better. So mm-hmm. I flew standby on the earlier flight, which was a 7.5, not the end of the world, an extra legroom seat, empty middle seat, which made it real good. Yeah, we spent two hours and 55 minutes out there on the taxiways waiting to take off, but damn it, we got out. We had five <laughs> minutes left on the clock before I'm not really sure what exactly would have turned us into a pumpkin. I think at the three-hour mark, we would have had to go back to the gate because of the the tarmac delay rules, but then there are no gates or fuel or crew, whatever. We were very much on the clock, and I had people on on Twitter listening to ATC saying, my crew is basically pleading, hey, we only have 28 minutes left. Can we please get out of here? And then eventually they got a route, which had us going all the way down to uh, North Carolina. 
out of New Jersey yeah. before we were able to turn west to get around the storms. And there's only so many flights that can do that at once. So we got real lucky. We made it out of there with about four and a half minutes to spare. My original flight that I moved off of did not make it out. They spent four and a half hours on the ground Ooh. before turning around and getting a gate. So uh, bullet that's, dodged that's rough. there. But I was on that 757. Technically, that flight did make it out, didn't it? No, it was outright canceled. So it wasn't your original flight that turned into a westbound red eye. No. So all the later ones, oh, that flight was oh, called, oh. that went back to the gate and, and the crew basically said, see you later, you're on your own. It was the later flights that went out at like midnight and got into LAX at 5 a.m., which is just oh. awful. But it's weird that my two hour, 55 minute delay is like, yeah, that's not so bad. All right. I'll take that. <laughs> take what you can get right there. Yeah, and on the the way back, I was on a one of the not well loved United High Density Domestic Triple <laughs> Sevens, the eighth oldest currently active Boeing Triple Seven, line number twenty two. Of course, all top like ten all belong to United. They like their old Triple Sevens, and it was it was fine. Except something happened in LAX on the way out that's never happened to me before. And I don't know if it's happened to many people. I, I hope not. But when I got there, the line for pre-trek was actually quite long. And I didn't want to bother with that because the line for regular security had had no one in it. And I figured, oh, what, whatever. I'll take my belt off, take my shoes off. It'll still be a whole lot quicker than pre-check. So I put all my stuff in one bin. I took my shoes off, took my belt off, my watch, put my bag in the thing. I left the bin there because it was one of those newer style x-ray machines where five people can line up at once, put their right, things right. in, and then the machine sucks it up and then puts it through the conveyor belt. And when it came through the other side, only one of my two shoes was in the bin, which isn't Oops. isn't great because you, you usually need two shoes, especially when you're flying across the country and you got to take all sorts of trains and flights. The TSOs, the TSA TSOs on the secure side at LAX could not have cared less that the machine presumably <laughs> ate one of my shoes. So there's always one of the officers on the other side who's taking the bins that were rejected to be secondary screened. And he said, well, you probably put it in wrong. Well, you know, that's just not helpful, man. Come on. I I know how to put a shoe in a I bin. still need I, the shoe back. I've done it before. And can you please help me find the shoe? What am I going to do here? And eventually I found a manager who was willing to go to the other side and found it uh, somehow on the floor. It got its own bin and went through the machine. And I didn't really think about it before, but these new style of machines where five people line up, you queue, you leave, basically. You go through the x-ray yeah. machine or, or the, the swirly thingy the whatever that is, the full body scanner. And then you just hope that your tray gets sucked into the queue properly and goes through the machine. You don't actually have eyes on it at that point. So during that time, anyone could do anything to that bin. The, the TSOs aren't really going to see everything going on. If recent news is any indication, they're probably going to steal stuff right out of your bag. I don't think that was at LAX. I think that was at Miami, which is not too surprising. Miami has a history of things like that. But it, it just was like, man, I didn't put the bat, the shoe in the bin wrong. The thing fell out or someone took it out or got <laughs> knocked out. I put the shoe in the bin, but I was very happy to be reunited with my shoe. I guess my question is, how would you put the shoe in the bin wrong? Like, I don't know. <laughs> how does that work? I, I guess if you overload the bin and it's kind of like sticking up and hanging off the side, maybe sure. it falls out. Right. I don't know, but be Whatever. a little more compassionate when a man's sitting there with one shoe in his hand and, and, and needs both. But I got there. It was fine. We got a gate early in Newark. You had a very different experience. So I was on the same plane both ways. And that's interesting. An interesting experience. On a hub-to-hub -hub route like that, you would not expect to see the same aircraft doing the same route like that repeatedly. Usually, they, they cycle them in, and then they go somewhere better. They did. They did go somewhere better. This was a really cool thing. So I got on the plane in Chicago. So this was a, a United 78710. I got on the plane in Chicago, flew to Los Angeles. The plane went from Los Angeles to Tokyo and back. And then took me home back to Chicago. So it only had time for one turn. That's awesome. Yeah. One, one Tokyo turn. So it goes to show you, I mean, fleet utilization, man. That's where it's right. at. But yeah, so getting out was fine. I love the domestic. So internet, it's Polaris configuration on the 787. This, so I use this trip to check off 
the 787 bingo card. The 10 was my remaining 787. So I've done the 8, the 9, and the 10. And that's, I mean, if we're being geeky about it, which is what this podcast is for, I'm pleased as punch that I was able to do that. I'm not bitter at all last year that you had <laughs> sucked out a dash 10 for that's a dash right. 9. Nope, nope. That's not right. at all bitter about that. So getting out was fine. My seatmate was super interesting. He was a guy who had been in Chicago, was headed home to Los Angeles, had seen the Pearl Jam show at United Center and was just on his way home. He was in film and television and a big music fan. He was, judging by his appearance, I'm going to say behind the camera in general, but he was telling me about some of his aviation exploits. So that was that was really fun to listen to, some of the things that he's done kind of flying-wise because of both his job and, and who he's friends with, things like flying bush planes in Alaska to go fishing and some other stuff. He had flown on an aircraft that has the, the Garmin Autoland enabled. Push the button. Yeah. He did not. I asked him, I'm like, well, how tempted were you to push the button? He's like super tempted. I was like, you didn't push the button, did you? He's like, no, I didn't. Ah. Did not want to get in trouble for that one. But yeah, so so going to Los Angeles was a completely uneventful flight. It was, it was great. I used the smart, I guess, tip of on an internationally configured 787, the Premium economy is sold as economy plus. You just have to look at the seat map and make sure you're clicking on the right seat when you're booking. So I took advantage of that. And then on the way home, nothing was terrible. It was it was like a comedy of anything that could go mildly wrong, like wrong enough to just be annoying is what happened. Like we the because the plane came That's back from Tokyo. And and the US is special right now. Yeah, yeah. It, and so like the plane came back from Tokyo. So Customs and Border Patrol had to go on board the plane and make sure it didn't bring back any puffer fish or salmon eggs or I don't even know what. But they did a, you know, a, a sweep of the plane and that was fine. But United didn't delay boarding. So they didn't tell anybody until everyone, they had lined everybody up to board. Oh, you got boarding, not boarding. That stinks. Yeah. And then they were like, oh, customs is on the plane, so we need to wait. And so that took 90 minutes. Fine, whatever. Thanks to schedule padding, we were still going to be roughly on time. Then the crew had to get on board and and get the plane ready and all that's fine. You get on board. And then we do that. We fly. It was a completely uneventful flight, a, a lovely crew, a wonderful way to end the weekend. Land. We did a couple circles, which was weird, but what I mean, what are you going to do? That's O'Hare. And then Uber was $90 to go from the airport to my house, a, a trip that is normally between $35 and $40. Did you pay it? No, absolutely not. On principle. All right. Blue line it is. This was a work trip. And for those going, why didn't you expense it? Just on principle. Yeah. Exactly the same reason why I took the Newark air train to Jersey transit to the three train to get back to Brooklyn or some nonsense. It took half as long as the flight from LA did. And I'm not paying $170 <laughs> no, to come to no, Newark. No, because not. yeah, it's just unconscionable that that is how much it costs. So I took the blue line a few stops and got a car from there and, and it all worked out. Well, you know what? I'm just going to quote our show notes here because we're already 20 minutes in. We got a lot of news. <laughs> yeah. uh, Great fun, good time was had by all. Thank you, Ian, for putting that in the show notes. I would not have known that otherwise. You would not have known that otherwise. Okay. So that was 20 minutes of what happened this weekend. If only to say it was an amazing experience and we're so grateful that so many people came up to us over the weekend and said, we love your podcast. And I listened to every episode and there were so many people who showed me, showed me their phone to prove that they had Flight Raider 24 as one of the most popular apps on their phone. I was like, that's fantastic. And to all of the people that said, hey, I have a problem and then told me their problem. And then either I've sent it on to our developers or product people for review. Thank you. That's how Flight Raider 24 gets better. So if you do have a question about the app or a problem with the website or anything like that, always email us. Because if you've got a problem, I guarantee somebody else does too. And we want to make sure that it's the best experience for, for everyone. As Jason said, we have a lot of news. News did not wait for us to kind of get back, reset, and grab our bearings. So, so hey, let's just dive right in. And by dive right in, I mean make a soft landing in a field outside of uh, Novosibirsk, which is exactly what a Ural A320 did. They've got to stop doing that. Yeah, right? This is the second in- Second that? since 2019. Three, four years, yeah. The first one, 
was a legitimate good idea. This one will get to why probably not what needed to happen. This was a Ural A320 flight from Sochi to Omsk that encountered hydraulic issues and so decided because the the hydraulic system on the A320 can impact things like braking, braking performance and being able to stop the aircraft on the runway. So they said, let's go to Novosibirsk and they have a long runway. All right. Nothing out of the ordinary or unprecedented. This is the that good makes perfect idea. sense. This is good piloting. You want a longer runway for situations where you don't know what the performance capability of your aircraft is. Good idea. Continue. Jason, what's one of the things that every pilot that you know of keeps an eagle eye on almost at all times, but especially uh, in an emergency scores. situation? Oh, in an emergency. <laughs> fuel. fuel. Fuel is a big one. Indeed, fuel is one of those things where air traffic control is often requesting, how much fuel do you have left? Both for a timing issue, but also to to understand how heavy the aircraft is going to be, and, and in the case of an emergency, how much fuel That's is going to be on board. Always the, the question, right? Number of souls on board and fuel remaining. Those and, are and the fuel two remaining. Questions. And these particular pilots failed to keep an eagle eye on the fuel remaining portion of the proceedings, and proceeded to near Novosibirsk land in a field because they ran out. Yeah. So obviously. We always say we wait for the final report to be issued by the respective investigation agencies in this case. But in this case, it really feels like a foregone conclusion here that this crew did what they thought was the right idea. And it obviously was. They they tried to divert to an airport with a longer runway, but they may not have taken to account that their landing gear was down and their flaps were deployed and probably couldn't retract due to the hydraulic issues. And your performance, your your range with all of these items out ruining your aerodynamics, your fuel consumption goes way up and your range goes way down. So if they did do any of the math to see what's our range, what divergent airports can we get to, they either did not do it or did it very improperly to the point where, I mean, when is the last time you can recall that a commercial jet aircraft ran out of fuel and had to ditch in a f- field. I can't even think of the last time this has happened. I mean, you've got the Azores glider, the Air Transat Azores glider. and That was a fuel leak, though. That wasn't caused by... You mean like just plain when is the ran last time tanks empty? Ran out of fuel and had to ditch somewhere that was not an airport. It has probably been... Decades? Beyond, yeah, I don't know. That one's a good question. Like, without mitigating circumstances where there where right. there's a, a mechanical issue or something like that. I mean, there were mechanical issues, but in this case, it wasn't like the fuel pump stopped working. Oh, okay, you know what? Maybe that's one that the BA ditching at Heathrow, where the fuel pumps got clogged right. with ice or something along those lines. But that's not really the same thing. This was just they ran out of fuel. I mean, I guess maybe Avianca on approach to JFK, but that was decades ago. I think that was before. Either of us were even a, a thing, and that wasn't they ditched. They just kind of <laughs> fell out of the sky. In this case, they just ran out of fuel and ditched. But thankfully, all is well that ends well. There were no injuries reported. The aircraft, thankfully, landed in a field, didn't encounter any boulders or, or whatever and break up. The aircraft will be broken up because it, it can't take off from a field. You never know until you try, Jason. Exactly. But uh, unfortunately, that will not be happening. So this is the second Airbus aircraft in four years that will be broken up in a field. Again, the first one, probably a good idea. This one, not. But yeah, it's. uh, I'm very interested. And hopefully, we get to see a a preliminary and final report. I, I assume Russian authorities are still doing that. Yeah. I mean, if nothing else, Russian in the Interstate Aviation Committee has been quite thorough in, in their reporting. Yeah. I'm a little disappointed that there's so much jump to praising the crew for safely putting the aircraft down when they seem to be the ones that put it there in the first place. But again, no injuries, luckily, thankfully. So can't be all that mad, I guess. But this is just something that should not have happened. And, and just yeah, luck exactly. on their side this time. Yeah. So we'll wait for the port. Oh, and speaking of Russian accident investigation reports. I have a link and it will be in the show notes for the last report that we talked about 
for the landing in Turkey by Nordwin. That will be in the show notes. I got a copy of the actual report rather than just the kind of the, the headlines on that and the, the initial pictures from social media. There is a full report with additional pictures. It doesn't paint a better picture. It just no. paints a more full one. Yes. Speaking of, I don't know. I don't have a transition for this one. Pratt and Whitney engines are just <laughs> messed up. I, I can't read the show note you have here because it's not. No, no. I put, I put a not family friendly line in the show notes. So choose your adverb accordingly. Yes. If you are an airline that has Pratt and Whitney engines on your 320neo or I guess A220, you are very unhappy right now. So RTX, which is the parent company of Pratt & Whitney, says that between six and 700 of the Pratt & Whitney 1100G engines need to be removed from the A320neo wings between now and 2026. And here's a quote. This is currently beyond Pratt & Whitney's shop visit forecast entering 2023. So this is an additional amount of aircraft that will need to be grounded so that their engines can come off the wing so that they can be inspected and retrofitted as necessary. They say that they're going to have most of them done by the middle of 2024, but... They're also going to have 350 aircraft on the ground, so so an average of 350 in the 2024 to 2026 period because of when the inspections are going to come due. There is now a flight cycle analysis that needs to be performed, so between the number of cycles and then the inspections are necessary, but then also replacements are necessary at different intervals. So it's getting worse for Pratt & Whitney as we learn more. In the third quarter, RTX will take a $3.5 billion charge. That's B billion. Uh, they'll be okay. I'm not too worried about them. They'll be fine. But I mean, it's still, I mean, you know, a billion here, billion there. Pretty soon we're talking about real money. So let's see which airlines are most impacted at the moment. We've got Hawaiian. The quotes from, I think it was the CFO of Hawaiian Airlines were just this side of unprintable. So they're not happy. Wiz is taking a 10% hit as far as their available aircraft capacity. And for They're an airline the size of Wiz, 10% yeah. is not like two planes. That is probably dozens. I mean, this is the flip side of fleet commonality. We've always talked about you know the, the doomsday scenario in regards to to Ryanair and, and Southwest, where if there's an issue with the Boeing 737, whether the NG or, or the MAX, at this point, if there's an issue that grounded those fleets, it would take those airlines offline. This is an issue that's grounding, you know, not entire fleets for entire airlines, but big chunks like Air New Zealand is, has had to reduce its capacity. Scoot's been affected to a lesser extent. And, you know, airlines that operate these, these engines are, are looking and going, what is the likelihood that I will have the A320neo available in my fleet at X date? Because they've got their schedules decided you know, for now. But then the next time they reconfigure the schedules, the next time those schedules come out, what is that airline going to do? Are they, are they, do they have to take into account that 10 of their aircraft are out of service or five of their aircraft are out of service or 20 of their aircraft are out of service? Yeah, this seems very similar to the early days of the 787 where the, sure, uh, the Rolls-Royce sure. engines just were not reliable. They had to be taken off wing and they, you had a lot of aircraft grounded at any given time. But that's when the 787 was a relatively new, not widespread aircraft. This is we're talking about the A220 and, and the 320neo series here. This is far more widespread, far more airlines, far more aircraft at any given time. Yeah, someone at Pratt & Whitney right now is, is doing the math on, on, on how much this is going to cost them, how long this is going to go, and honestly, how much future sales they're going to be missing out on here. Because if I were an airline, I wouldn't be too happy about this. Airlines are not happy. Indigo has basically said, give us any old Airbus aircraft you can, as long as it doesn't have these engines on it. We will take A320 COs. We will take, well, I, I guess that's really the only older aircraft. But from anybody, we'll, we'll take them. Whatever you got, we'll take them because we need to get you know, because they, they operate in a nearly all A320neo fleet, and we need to get these aircraft back up in the air. So we'll, we'll take whatever you got. 
Good luck to every one of them. Pour a drink for fleet planners at any of these yes. affected airlines because they're going to need it. Not necessarily related to the particular issues that we're talking about because we just don't know yet, but something that we wanted to flag is the Air China A320 Neo engine fire that happened in Singapore earlier this week. It was an Air China A320 Neo from Chengdu to Singapore carrying 146 passengers and nine crew. I'm always amazed by how many crew foreign airlines carry. Right? You ever notice that? Crew? Like nine crew on an A320 Neo. On an A320, that's wild. Yeah. So obviously, A320 Neo operated or powered by the, the Pratt & Whitney 1100G engines, suffered an engine fire. Everybody you know, was safe getting off the aircraft and, and no injuries, thankfully. But we don't know, you know what caused it. So just, just flagging that kind of in the same news bracket, but not trying to say that it was caused by any of these issues. Just not a great week for the A320 Neo as news of the Pratt & Whitney kind of furthering engine issues come about and then this fire as well. We shall turn our attention now to Boeing. We now know that the Alaska Airlines 737-800 that suffered a uh, gear through wing issue, main landing gear through <laughs> I, I wing don't issue. A term for this. I'm a podcaster. I can make up terms, right? Sure. All right. I don't know. That problem, the reason the gear ended up going through the, the left wing is because of a fractured trunnion pin. Uh, you got to look out for those fractured trunnion pins. They'll get you. Exactly. So the preliminary report's out. There'll be a link to that in the show notes. But for all of the talk, and Jason, I think you were the one who, who gave us caution when we first discussed this particular incident. You said, looking at things, you know, you doubted that it would be a hard landing on the part of the pilots based on the visual evidence that was available. And sure enough, the NTSB coming through and saying, you know, no, it was a fractured trunnion pin. That's true. So there you go. Yeah, the NTSB in their initial report put out some information about what it takes to be classified a hard landing at Alaska Airlines because every, I guess, every airline has their own specifications, their own limits on when you would need to actually conduct a hard landing investigation. And in this case, they pulled the recorders from the aircraft and had a maximum vertical acceleration of 1.71 Gs where the minimum required for hard landing at Alaska on this aircraft, at least, would have been 2.2 Gs. So it was, yeah, it was a forceful landing, but given the consideration of the horrible weather at the time, the short runway, they were simply putting you the You want to make sure the aircraft has landed. Yes, and the, the pilots did actually a phenomenal job, if you read the report, because it wasn't, wasn't that hard a landing. The left engine was, was dragging on the surface of the runway. I like the captain's comments where it's like, it's kind of pulling to the left. Yeah, it's pulling a little to the left, but they were able to counteract that with rudder to the right, and they were able to keep the aircraft bang on center line and then taxi it off a little bit, and then they stopped and they said, you know what, maybe we should poke our head out the window and take a look, which is exactly what they did. But kudos yeah. to the crew for keeping it on the center line and getting it off the runway. And this is a case of, well, let's not jump to conclusions because the evidence we have really doesn't support that it was a hard landing because it looked pretty soft to me. And indeed, that yeah. is the case. Yeah. A firm landing, but not one that would normally result in the landing gear. Landing with intention, like every other landing you'll ever see at LaGuardia. There you go. In final report news, we now have the final report for United Flight 328, which was the 777 that left Denver in February of 2021 and promptly had an uncontained engine failure. The Pratt & Whitney PW4077 engine failed not long after takeoff, and that particular engine powered a subset of the 777 fleet, and that particular fleet was promptly grounded until adequate inspections of all of the engines could be carried out. The NTSB issuing its final report saying partially that the engine design and testing were to blame, but also the fact that the inspections were inadequate because there were already required inspections for this particular engine. The root cause was actually kind of already known and had been flagged by FAA airworthiness directives. And the NTSB says that inspections of this particular engine had actually revealed metal fatigue in the oh. fan blade that failed. 
But the blade, despite showing evidence of metal fatigue, had not been removed from the engine. Well, that's problematic. Lesson learned. Yeah. Big lesson learned. I always wonder if the guy who ended up with the inlet cowling got to keep that. Probably not. But well, it's like you know, a foul ball in baseball. If you catch it out in the crowd, you can keep it. <laughs> if it lands in your pickup truck, it's yours now. Yeah. And that was line number five. So even older than the aircraft I was on by a good bit. That was, I believe, N772 UA. I was I think on so. 775. Yeah. So, you know, I had lots of buffer from being on that aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. But your aircraft has since been thoroughly inspected and retrofitted if necessary and is now on a scheduled inspection regime. Fantastic. That was what the airworthiness directive that came out of this accident required. At 30 years old, I'd rather it be on a scheduled retirement flight to Mojave (laughs) or something like enough. Soon enough. Soon enough. Let's see. So the link to the report will be in the show notes. And now we move on to the kind of good news section good of the podcast stuff. like the, the good stuff the fun stuff yeah the good stuff like the 321xlr is going to go find itself on some journeys As, across, <laughs> yes, it, across, it is the, on. across europe across the atlantic gonna check out the u.s and head back onto france and, and debrief it's what it wants to do when it grows up exactly it's gonna find itself jason The A321XLR is embarking on a 10-day route proving tour. The first was a lovely Mediterranean tour lasting about seven hours. The second flight is a polar flight, which our own Chris Lomas is currently on board. We're recording this on Wednesday, the 13th of September. They are in the air at the moment flying to the North Pole and back from Toulouse. And Chris will be on the show next week to give us his take on what do you do on a route proving flight? What happens? What is going on? Because I have no idea other than I know they're flying this particular path and making sure that the plane works. So we're going to talk with Chris next week and we'll have much more on our blog and on our YouTube channel from this particular flight and his experience in Toulouse. Generally, he's speaking with a lot of very interesting people, including the flight test engineers, the ground telemetry engineers, as well as the actual flight crew from the aircraft. The coolest thing, and I didn't know that this was a requirement for certification, the aircraft has to be kept on for 10 days, powered on for 10 days. They can't turn I mean, it off. That's not all that unusual because what was it, the, the airworthiness directive for the 787? Like you have to reboot it once Every a month, so otherwise many it's going to pull yeah. it out of the sky and kill everyone on board. Like that was a yes. real thing, right? Yeah, it sure was. So this particular set of flights, will the aircraft will be on the entire time. Powered and I don't think time. I'm exaggerating that case. It was quite literally, there is a limitation the, on the number of hours you could keep the 787 powered on for before everything fails, basically. Yeah, the, all the computers would restart. So if you were in the air, all the That's computers would restart. It's a computerized Especially aircraft. if you're about to land. So, yeah, that could be a problem. So really cool stuff, and we'll hear more from Chris next week. So stay tuned for that and, and check out our blog for updates before then. Jason? We've talked about this next thing maybe three or four times, and it's always been in six months, or they're looking at the review, or it might be coming. But now, now it seems that this week, Mexico will achieve or regain its FAA Category 1 status, which is huge news. Great if true and real. (laughs) Huge if true. Since May of 2021, they have had wow. the lower FAA safety rating, something we thought would be days, weeks, maybe months if things are really out of whack down in Mexico. But yeah, this is a long time. I hope they're able to regain that. But as we talked about recently, Mexico's playing around with the aviation industry mm-hmm. a little bit too much. So maybe the FAA doesn't feel like re-upping that safety rating. We'll see. We'll see. So updates this week. Next week, hopefully we can report it's official. They've achieved their Category 1 rating. And you know who's going to make that decision? Yes. Well, maybe. We'll see. But I like like where you're going with that. Thank you. Go ahead. By all means, take this one. A new appointee has been proposed, I guess, to take lead of the FAA as they have not had a permanent head for two years years now, I think. Michael Whitaker, currently the chief commercial officer for Supernom. Am I getting that right? Doesn't matter. I I think so. 
<laughs> a Hyundai company developing an electric air vehicle who served as the deputy FAA administrator under the Obama administration, which is very interesting. So any possible rebuttal or dissent to Whitaker's nomination here should be swift rejection because he was already the deputy FAA administrator. So who better could you ask for at this point? Yeah. I haven't seen any pushback. I've seen airlines, I've seen unions, I've seen senators who need to approve the nomination say that it's a good nomination, should be swiftly approved, and Just everyone's looking forward it already. To, That's to having a, a permanent head. We so need to have be- a permanent head already. This has gone on way too long. And honestly, at this rate, yeah. maybe this happens by the end of the current administration. Maybe. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Washington maybe. doesn't seem to be in the habit of making things happen too quickly these days. So we'll see. <sighs> we will see. Hopefully, this one moves through quickly. Jason, let's talk about some orders. And I think the first one is the most interesting, if only because the aircraft has experienced not quite a name change, but a a developer change or a developer refinement. We've whittled down the developer, and now there's an airline picking up a clean 10 of them. Yeah. So the MC-21, which used to be called the Aircut MC-21, is now seemingly being rebadged as the Yak-21, I think, or is that the Yak-MC-21? I'm not really sure, but this had previously been referred to as the USA, the United Aircraft Corporation, MC-21. But it seems like in this order for Aurora, which used to be a subsidiary of Aeroflot, which is now all on their own out in the way far east of Russia, I think, has ordered 10 MC-21s for, and I'm air quoting right now, as with any, any, not picking on the Russian development here, I'm picking on all aircraft development, air quoting delivery between 2027 and 2030. That seems a little optimistic, but you never know. So good to hear of orders for an aircraft you don't really hear much about these days. It's a bit of other circumstances going on in that country. Yeah. Switching gears to the 737 MAX, we've got a 25-strong order from SMBC Aviation, the the lessor there, bringing their total order book up to 81. And then Vietnam Airlines has, Jason, it's a, quote, commitment to order, I believe, 50 737-8 MAX aircraft. So it's not even an MOU, not a firm order, not not options, a, a commitment to order. It's like between an LOI and an MOU, maybe? They, they I, commit I don't know. to it, but only if you know they're really committed. There you go. Speaking of commitment, Lufthansa parked their A380s and said, no, we're not going to fly them anymore. And this was early on in the pandemic. And then they said, okay, we're going to bring them back. And now they're saying, okay, we're going to keep them around. Because of the delays in the 777X program, of which Lufthansa is a, I think Emirates is a launch customer, but I think they're kind of, you know, just right alongside. It's really been clear. Yeah. Because of the delays in the 777X program, Lufthansa is looking at keeping its A380s in the fleet at least until the late 2020s, if not early 2030s. So your chance to fly on a four-engined passenger aircraft, your last chance with a flag carrier, I would say, you know, barring any kind of random one-off airlines, is probably going to be Lufthansa. Yeah, that or a Conviasa Bay 340-300 that will probably be in service forever. But if you're looking to fly said A380, Lufthansa and partner, Swiss, just has the whole slew of new and somewhat interesting routes, actually, to Mm -hmm. North America. So the A380 specifically will be popping into Washington, Dulles, which is interesting. There are already some other A380s in Dulles. I think Lufthansa joins British Airways and Emirates down in Dulles, which is nice. But they're also adding some new routes for summer 2024, two new dots for Lufthansa, and that would be Frankfurt to Raleigh-Durham and Frankfurt to Minneapolis, which is really going to piss off Delta. I'm I'm surprised we already haven't seen a rebuttal (laughs) about that one, but they're also adding Munich to Seattle. Not an A380 route just yet, but Munich is Lufthansa's A380 home base, so wouldn't be out of the question to see a Munich-Seattle 
A380 route on Lufthansa. If does the A380 even have the legs to do that? That's quite a long flight. I'm not sure. Yeah, just probably. But yeah. we'll look into that. Probably. Yeah. Interestingly, also, Swiss is adding Zurich to Dulles. Dulles is a popular destination these days. And also seasonal Zurich to Toronto, which is a historically a very underserved airport for international competition. Canada is usually very protectionary on its routes. But all in total, Lufthansa Group will have 27 distinct North American destinations in summer 2024, which is just kind of wild. I mean, it's really fascinating to me what their strategy has been. And as we talk about Lufthansa, I feel like we should talk about the wider Lufthansa group because we got a handful of helpful emails over the week because we talked about Discover Airlines last week. And Jason and I had expressed some some kind of confusion about where this was coming from and Eurowings Discover versus Discover. And we've been informed by folks in Germany and folks outside of Germany that basically they were always separate airlines and they used Eurowings because Eurowings was a well-known brand and Lufthansa needed the money from the German government. So it was easier to sell Eurowings to the German public and it was easier to sell Eurowings to the German government. So they didn't want to start by building a new brand. But this was always the plan from the get-go to have two separate airlines with different names. And so the breakout is just kind of the plan coming to fruition rather than Lufthansa deciding something new at this point on the fly. So thank you to the folks that wrote in and provided that explanation. It yeah, was uh, enlightening, getting, but also still confusing. Still not getting why there's Lufthansa and other Lufthansa and other Lufthansa. And don't forget all of the other Lufthansas and also somehow ITA plays into this somehow. It's all very confusing. None of it makes sense. You can try to yeah. rationalize it, but there is no rationalizing it. It's confusing. It's extreme market segmentation is what it is. Sure. Shall we end the show with something new? Something Pacific, maybe. Hmm. Maybe an airline. Yeah. If you are familiar with Northern Pacific, which wasn't really doing anything in the North nor anything over the Pacific, turns out they needed a new name because someone was already called Northern Pacific, and apparently they didn't look into that too hard. But their new name Oops. is New Pacific Airlines. Still not flying anywhere over the Pacific, unfortunately. But if you're looking for <laughs> Northern Pacific, try looking for New Pacific Airlines. And I, so I find it interesting. Northern that Pacific that, Airways is now New Pacific Airlines. Yeah, they didn't even want to keep the airways. They switched to airlines, no, airways. which they didn't seem to need. But okay, whatever. Good luck to them. So new name and good luck to them. <laughs> I guess, like, I appreciate their transparency too, because they were like, yeah, we're changing our name because we're getting sued. Yeah. All right. Thanks for letting us know. So, That's a lot of signage that just went up to change, a lot of liveries to change, a lot of collateral to change. That's expensive for an airline that probably doesn't have all that much capital going on right now. Well, hopefully they can figure something out. Maybe just like a Sharpie or something. Yeah. Yeah. White out and Sharpie never fails. Problem solved. All right. I have to say, this was a large episode. Not the episode that I had kind of initially planned this week. I was like, well, we'll soft pedal back into things after Dorkfest. It'll be a good episode. But then the aviation industry was like, we never stop. And Nothing it's true. Stops. It never stops. Unless it's you're a 20, the, 24 hour a day. Powered well, and there's... you know, maybe, I don't know. That was a low blow. Didn't need that. that was... It felt right. But it felt like you just slipped it right in there. In any case, this has been episode 233 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik, here as always with Jason Rabinowitz. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.